Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is entitled, God's Mission, My Mission. This is lesson number four in that series, entitled, Sharing God's Mission. It's the lesson for October 28 of 2023. And as usual, we like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, as we think of these challenges that you're placing before us, help us to know how we can see the truth about you and your character more clearly, that we may reflect it more clearly to those around us as our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Are the people of the world attracted to Christians because they see the love we have for each other? You remember Jesus' words? Let's look at that really quickly. John 13, 34, 35. And now I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. Okay, is, it, is, is, is the church known for that in 2023? Don't think so. No. Oh dear. This lesson will focus on the stories of Abraham, this, multiple stories of Abraham, from Genesis 14 to Genesis 19. Abraham was called from his home in the Ur, Ur of the Chaldees to go to a land that he had never seen. It was full of heathen people worshiping fertility cult gods. They were known for their violence. We do not know exactly how God communicated with Abraham. Did Abraham see visions in the night with instructions? Well, we know one time he did, didn't he? Take now thy son, thine only son. It was a vision in the night. Did he get guiding messages during the day? Well, it sounds like it. Whatever the methodology was, it seems clear that Abraham was certain that these messages came from God. If you woke up from the middle of the night and someone said, take your son and sacrifice him, would you say, excuse me, just let me rub my eyes? You know, would you say, hold on, could you say that again? Obviously, I don't know, there was this, he recognized the voice. I mean, obviously, there was no question in his mind that, that this was God talking to him. I think the text says, is God. It doesn't say the, the Lord. Yeah. So, so it, it, it could be a mix-up. It could have been harking back to his uh, pagan uh, understanding because Yahweh then says, hey, take, take this, this ram. So uh, it could be a, 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 well, a flashback from the, from the pagan upbringing that he had. We believe that God knows every detail of our lives, every day and even what we think. And our lead story is recorded in Genesis 18. Jesus Christ, along with two of his companion angels, appeared on a road and approached Abraham, who was resting near his tent in the heat of the day. Where are we? I don't know. From the writer of Ellen White, Abraham had seen his guests only three tired warfare, warf Wayfair. wayfarers. Excuse me. Uh, little thinking that among them was one who might worship without, without he sin. Might he might worship without sin. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, 138. One okay. he might worship without sin means God himself. Yep. In Genesis 18, we will focus on three great spiritual qualities of Abraham. Hospitality, love, and prayer. Do we have these qualities by Abraham's standards? Are we ready to sec exercise them on behalf of our neighbors and friends and those living in areas around us? Genesis 18, 1 to 5. Carrie? 1 to 15. Well, I'm sorry, 1 to 15. The Lord appeared to Abraham at the sacred trees of Mamre. As Abraham was sitting at the entrance of his tent during the hottest part of the day, he looked up and saw three men standing there. As soon as he saw them, he ran out to meet them. Bowing down with his face touching the ground, and the ground he said, Sirs, please do not pass my home without stopping. I am here to serve you. 
Let me bring some water for you to wash your feet. You can rest here beneath the tree. I will also bring a bit of food. It will give you strength to continue your journey. You have honored me by coming to my home, so let me serve you. Okay, now let's think about this for a minute. How many people did Abraham have working for him? 318 soldiers. Trained soldiers. Now, thousands is what uh, thousands we have, read. we have read, exactly. So, what's happening here? Did any, were any of them involved in any way? Well, this is very interesting. Look what happened. Go ahead, read on. They replied. Oh, me? I was thinking about my grandparents taking in a lot of soldiers in World War II. <laughs> yeah. Just, okay, well then let, let Jennifer pick it up there. They replied, thank you, we accept. Abraham hurried into the tent and said to Sarah, quick, take a sack of your best flour and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and picked out a calf that was tender and fat and gave it to a servant who hurried to get it ready. He took some cream, some milk, and the meat and set the food before the men. There under the tree he served them himself and they ate. What happened to kosher? Yes, this is a question I have very <laughs> quick. <laughs> okay, so what is kosher for many people who don't understand it? Well, you it goes back to the don't boil a kid in this mother's, mother's milk, milk yeah. from, from the uh, hitch or the Deuteronomy 14. Yeah, but it's the from heathen the heathen ceremonies yeah, where yeah. to boil a kid in its yeah. mother's milk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and, and the Jews to this day, the really faithful ones, they do not eat meat and milk in the same meal. They found that in the mm -hmm. Ebla tablets there at Rosh mm -hmm. Shamra years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then they asked him, go ahead. Then they asked him, where is your wife, Sarah? She is there in the tent, he answered. One of them said, nine months from now, I will come back and your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Okay, now let me just ask you a question. Just think about this for a moment. Strangers come to your house, far as you know, you've never seen them before. And pretty soon, uh, I'm gonna come back at nine months from now and your wife's gonna be pregnant. And you're saying, what? She's not gonna be <laughs> well, pregnant, she'll have a son. Yes. Well, yeah, she'll have a son. I'm sorry, you're right. She will have a son. D did he already know something? <laughs> he knew something was special about them because he was pretty excited to see those three. That's yeah, that right? Okay. No. Go ahead. Um, Sarah was behind him at the door of the tent, listening. Abraham and Sarah were very old, and Sarah had stopped having her monthly periods. So Sarah laughed to herself and said, now that I am old and worn out, can I still enjoy sex? And besides, my husband is old too. Then the Lord asked Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, can I really have a child when I am so old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. As I said, nine months from now, I will return and Sarah will have a son. Of course, they so, didn't know that this was the Lord at that time. That's right. They didn't know it was Yahweh. Well, he's starting to call him Yahweh here. Yeah. Because Sarah was afraid, she denied it. I didn't laugh, she said. Yes, you did, he replied. You laughed. From the American okay. Bible Society. Good news. Yes. Okay, go ahead. But Sarai was not the first one to have laughed at this idea. Look at Genesis 17, 15 to 18. We had to, I had to cut this out because the lesson was too long, but Look at this. Uh, Dwayne, can you read that at the top there? Yeah. God said to Abraham, you must no longer call your wife Sarai. From now on, her name is Sarah. I will bless her and I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she will become the mother of nations and there will be kings among her descendants. Abraham bowed down with his face touching the ground, but he began to laugh when he thought. Can a man have a child when he is a hundred years old? Can Sarah have a child at 90? He asked God, why not let Ishmael be my heir? Okay. Well, that seemed like an obvious comment, right? 
Does it seem right to you for God to bless a couple that laughed at his comments and then lied to him? So Abraham laughed and he probably related that story to Sarah and when, and when the three her got there, her, okay. Sarah, Sarah laughed. Okay. And what did they name their son? Laughter. <laughs> Isaac, I'm, some stand-up yeah. comedy, huh? <laughs> okay. Why was Abraham sitting outside in the heat of the day at a time when almost everyone is looking for rest in the shade? It seems clear that Abraham was prepared to offer hospitality to virtually anyone who came along. In addition to his hospitality, Abraham was probably anxious to hear whatever news the strangers might have for him. He did not have a newspaper, no television, no radio or internet to help him keep up to date with news from other parts of the country or the rest of the world. He rushed out and implored his visitors to pause briefly while he provided them with water and some food. I'm sure that Abraham had plenty of food and plenty of water, so he didn't have any trouble doing that. It's interesting to notice that this story seems to unfold as if Abraham lived in a solitary place with his wife. I mean, if you read that without knowing any background, oh, this guy lives beside a trail somewhere, and these people just came wandering along and there's nobody else around, right? Uh, but we know that. What do we know? Well, Ellen G. White says, God called Abraham to be the teacher of his word. He chose him to be the father of a great nation because he saw that Abraham would instruct his children and his household in the principles of God's law. And that which gave power to Abraham's teaching was the influence of his own life. His great household consisted of more than a thousand souls, many of them heads of families, and not a few, but newly converted from heathenism. Such a household required a firm hand at the helm. No weak, vacillating methods would suffice. Abraham's influence extended beyond his own household. Wherever he pitched his tent, he set up beside it an altar for sacrifice and worship. When the tent was removed, the altar remained. And many a roving Canaanite, whose knowledge of God had been gained from the life of Abraham, his servant, tarried at that altar to offer a sacrifice to Jehovah from the book Education, page 187. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Okay, a roving Canaanite mm -hmm. traveling around, he sees the, he comes to the altar, he knows that this has been a, an altar that was placed there by Abraham, clearly that was pretty obvious. How much does he know about God? Well, it was a sacrifice what God would have wanted. And, I mean, that's the next question, obviously. Could, clearly, Abraham had an influence he, uh, to those people he, around him. I've, I've, call, I've told people, I said, Abraham was running our university. You know, he's teaching parents and children all the way. And there, I don't, it says he had a firm hand. Uh, obviously, he didn't tolerate nonsense, um, and people people appreciated the way he treated them. People who worked for him, and a lot of people just sort of attached themselves to him. It sounds like. Does it seem possible that Abraham and Sarah were preparing food for these visitors by themselves? Where were all their helpers and servants? I mean, I'm just asking you to think about the story. Would it be safe for us to do what Abraham did? Could we invite anyone walking down the, strip, the street to come into our homes? Or do we really need security systems to prevent strangers from getting into our homes? It seems to me that Abraham modeled the method that God used subsequent to that. Yeah. How, how, we are to, how we are to minister to others around us. Yeah. Well, it's a, hey, Abraham didn't live in, in a city no. with gangs and so on. There may have been gangs around. There some hostile. Sodom was. Hostile, hostile neighbors who overran the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. 
They were distant neighbors. <laughs> yeah, okay, distant neighbors. Across the valley. Yeah. Yeah. We, don't, we, don't know, we don't know how friendly the people were that were around him. Yeah. I mean, did, I mean if, 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 you're a, if you're a farmer and you you're, have a small plot and you're trying to raise some stuff there and have a few animals and along comes a man with thousands of animals and thousands of employees and so forth like this and just sort of whoosh, right through your territory, do you say, Excuse me. <laughs> I was here. I mean, first. he had 318 soldiers. Yeah. So. Trained soldiers. Trained soldiers. Yes. So you have to kind of go, okay. To guard his flocks. To guard his flocks. And all the her herds. Whether they were yeah. in a city or not. Yeah. Yeah. So there were gangs around, huh? Yeah. Okay. So the second thing we talk about is Abraham's love, even for pagans. Abraham loved even the wicked people that lived around him. Okay? From Genesis 18, verses 16 to 33. Then the men left and went to a place where they could look. Sorry. So this is, this is after the, uh, the After discussion. the previous discussion, yes. Yeah. Looked down over Sodom, and Adam, Abraham went with them to send them on their way. And the Lord said to himself, I will not hide from Abraham what I am going to do. His descendants will become a great and mighty nation, and through him I will bless all the nations. I have chosen him in order that he may command his sons and his descendants to obey me and to do what is right and just. If they do, I will do everything for him that I have promised. Then the Lord said to Abraham, there are terrible accusations against Sodom and Gomorrah and their sin is very great. I must go down to find out whether or not the accusations which I have heard are true. Okay, now we gotta stop for a second. Did he really need to go down? No. <laughs> to go down. What is happening here? He's, he's putting, he's putting into in a human terms. Okay, we have a big long word for that. It's called anthropomorphism. He's, he's writing about God as if he were a human being, okay? I have to go investigate, but God knew. Then the two men left and went on towards Sodom, but the Lord remained with Abraham. Abraham approached the Lord and asked, are you really going to destroy the innocent with the guilty? If there are 50 innocent people in the city, will you destroy the whole city? Won't you spare it in order to save 50? Okay, I'm gonna interrupt for a second again. Now, Abraham, how, how many people living with him and working with him? About a thousand. Probably a few thousand. Thousands. Thousands, thousands probably. Okay. <clears throat> Lot was his nephew. He went down to the Fertile Valley. Surely he has at least 500, right? Yeah. Well, isn't that what you would think? Don't know. Whatever it is, he could sit uh, sit at the gate of the city. So I, who knows what he was doing? Yeah, we don't know. It's just we can speculate. Uh, mm -hmm. You might call that s sanctified speculation, but there it is, still s speculation. We okay, don't... there's some more history here. Go ahead. If there are fifty innocent people in the city, will you destroy the whole city? Won't you spare it in order to save the fifty? Surely you won't kill the innocent with the guilty. Surely, God, you won't, wouldn't do that. Mm. That's impossible. You couldn't do that. You can't do that. If you did, the innocent would be punished along with the guilty. That is impossible. The judge of all the earth has to act justly. Wow. The Lord answered, If I find 50 innocent people in Sodom, I will spare the whole city for your sake. Okay, do you talk to God like that when you pray? I don't God know. is not insecure. You can talk to him any way you like. <laughs> I don't usually even talk to other people that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. The Lord answered, if I find 50 innocent people in Sodom, I will spare the whole city for their sake. Abraham spoke again. Please provide my, please, forgive. please forgive my boldness in continuing to speak to you, Lord. I am only a man and have no right to say anything, but perhaps there will be only 45 innocent people instead of 50. Will you destroy the whole city because there are five too few? The Lord answered, I will not destroy the city if I find 45 people. Innocent. Innocent, innocent people. people. 
And then Abraham continued to plead for even smaller numbers. Verse 32, Abraham said, Please don't be angry, Lord, and I will speak just once more. What if only ten are found? He said, I will not destroy it if there are ten. After he had finished speaking with Abraham, the Lord went away and Abraham returned home. Good okay. news Bible. Okay, now I'm going to stop and I'm going to ask you a question. This is what chapter in Genesis? 18. 18. 18. What happened in Genesis 14? Do you remember? That's the time when Abraham went out with his 15, with 318 trained soldiers along with a couple of other helpers and however many they had, and they, they, I don't know what all they did to him, but they conquered these kings from other nations. And what did they do? What did they come back with? All these people we're talking about here. The people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham knew these people. He, at least, I mean, I'm not sure. He, he probably didn't know all of them by individual names, that kind of stuff. But at least he had some idea. One of the prisons he rescued was Lot and his friends. Do you think that Abraham said, well, how are you doing? How many people have you evangelized down in the city of Sodom? So these people knew Abraham, even if Abraham didn't individually know them. Mm -hmm. Abraham's that guy that rescued us. Mm -hmm. That was exactly. at least the leadership through. Yeah. Well, I mean, and they were not, yeah. I mean, if, if you were in a whole bunch of people that had been taken prisoners to be slaves, because that's what would have happened to them, and someone comes along and rescues you, I, I think you would know about it. What would you say if you believed that God had told you to do, told you that he was about to destroy two major cities near you? It doesn't say that God is going to destroy him. That's what it says. Now, you, you can say interpret that? it. It's after you have to interpret it that way. But uh, Abraham finally figured out that God wasn't going to destroy the place. And history shows that God protected, uh, offered protection to, to four of four, just like he did with the flood. 120 years, he says, there's a flood coming. Mm -hmm. Does that mean God's the, uh, the active agent in that? Is it God the active agent that brought the... Uh, the um, Asteroid or whatever it is. We, we, from what we read was that book on the story of Sodom. Uh, that, that, it was, well, that similar thing happened in Russia. Uh, yeah. we, we read things into this thing that uh, we from read. our theological spectacles that are clouded. Well, we read what's there. Now, we, we interpret what's there. And obviously, well, it doesn't some people say that God is going to destroy. It's important to... I mean, that's what Abraham thought. He did think until finally, after when he said 10, well, I, I guess you're not going to destroy the place. Yeah, he thought there must be at least 10. I think it's interesting that the discussion at the beginning, Abraham said, please, you know, he was very gracious mm -hmm. and approaching the Lord with such care. This mm -hmm. must be how he dealt with his people and that they appreciated yeah. that type yeah. of leadership. Didn't make them feel like they were. In any case, it's very clear that Abraham is pleading for Sodom and Gomorrah. It is important to remember that Abraham already had rescued Lot and all the people of Sodom and Gomorrah from the marauding kings from the east. And to see the story in Genesis 14. As we have seen above, Abraham had been an effective evangelist, having won many heathen people, people to worship the new God. No doubt he felt that his nephew Lot had done the same. Abraham must have had some idea about the kind of people who lived in those cities. I mean, he, he, you know, he seemed to know some of that. He certainly might have had some idea. But Abraham was hoping that some of those people, some of these people either would have already learned the truth from Lot or at least would be open to learning about the truth about God in the future. So what do we know about the people who lived in Sodom? Genesis 19, 1 through 11. When the two angels came to Sodom that evening, Lot was sitting at the city gate. As soon as he saw them, he got up and wept, went to meet them. He bowed down before them and said, Sirs, I'm here to serve you. Please come to my house. You can wash your feet and stay the night and the morning. You can get up early and go on your way. But the answer, no, no, we'll, we'll, we'll spend the night here in the city square. 
He kept on urging them, and finally they went with him to his house. Lot ordered the servants to bake some bread and prepare a fine meal for the guests. When it was ready, they ate it. Before the guests went to bed, the, man, the men of Sodom surrounded the house. All the men in the city, both young and old, were there. They called out to Lot and asked, where are the men who came to stay with you tonight? Bring them out to us. The men of Sodom wanted to have sex with them. Lot went outside and closed the door behind him. He said to them, friends, I beg you, don't do such a wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who are still virgins. Let me bring them out to you and you can do whatever you want with them. But don't do anything to these men. They are guests in my house and I must protect them. Wow. I mean, that just blows my mind. Yeah. So how good were those people in Sodom that, that he wished that, that uh, Lot was uh, evangelizing to? I mean, he, it's, if Lot knew they were no good, he knew yeah. they were, yet he hung around them. It's, it's like uh, people subscribe to a, a point of view, yet they know the thing is uh, <laughs> vacuous. Well, but they said, Get out of our way, you foreigner. Who are you to tell us what to do? Out of our way, or we will treat you worse than them. They pushed Lot back and moved up to break the door. But the two men inside reached out, pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Then they struck all the men outside with blindness so that they couldn't find the door. Okay. This is all the men of Sodom. So all those that came to the door anyway. Well. It says all the men of Sodom. Yeah, but came, the, there, you know. there you got the license of, of editing. It, it here. wasn't two this or three. This is hearsay. Yeah, it wasn't two or three. No. Poetic license. <laughs> it was enough that <laughs> I would be afraid. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that Abraham was pleading for all the people in Sodom and Gomorrah, or was he pleading for the people that he hoped Lot had been able to evangelize in those cities? Think of how many Abraham personally had won into the cause of God, and we've already re look, reviewed that. Would you describe the discussion between Abraham and God as prayer? Ellen White wrote these words about prayer. Let's see, where are we? Jim? Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. Not as an, not as it, not that. Not that it is necessary in order to make God known to what we are, but in order to enable us to receive Him. Prayer does not bring God down to us, but brings us up to Him. Ellen White, Steps of Christ, nine, page 93. Wow. So was that discussion between Abraham and God, was that technically intercessory prayer? Is intercessory prayer an important aspect of our lives? Well, I'll tell you a story here. On one occasion, I was in a small group of students at a Saturday night party. Uh, a young woman that I had never met before asked me if I knew anything about the Bible and about God. At that point in time, I had no idea why she would even ask me such a question. I was quite taken aback. She had a question. Her question was a challenging one. She had a cousin who had been involved in a serious automobile accident and was lying unconscious in the intensive care unit four or 500 miles away from her. She could not go to him and she obviously could not talk to him to encourage him. She wanted to know if she prayed for that young man, would it do any good? I explained a little bit about the great controversy to her and then told her that God can do things if we, pray, we are praying that he otherwise could not do because of Satan's opposition. If we were not praying, if we were not praying, of course, the explanation went on for some time. I went into quite a bit of detail. Several weeks later, in fact, when I started to explain it, says, you know, this might take a while. She says, we've got all night. <laughs> <laughs> Several weeks later, she told me that she had been asking that question to everyone she thought might be able to help her for seven years and, I, and that I was the first one who had given her a reasonable answer. She had asked pastors, she had asked nuns, she had asked priests. So this was a hypothetical? No, it was a true story. That, but the, that she was praying for the young man? For, for seven cousin. years? Yes. No. <laughs> no, she had been asking, a, I don't know for sure what happened to the, I think the young man actually finally recovered. But the young man was her cousin. But since that experience, she had been asking people, okay, 
what's going on here? Does it do any good to pray? Seven years. That's what she told me. I take her word for it. Okay, after looking at the discussion between Abraham and God in Genesis 18, 22 to 32, look at James 5, 16. Carrie? So then, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you will be healed. The prayer of a good person has a powerful effect. And that's from the Good News Bible. And then in brackets, this verse seems to be telling us to pray for other church members. If you go back and you look at the context, it's, it's talking about how we should deal with other church members. Does that mean we're not, we're not supposed to pray for people outside the church? No. Sure, that's not what he intended. Yeah. What, what, imp oh, what, <laughs> what impact do you think your prayers have on the great controversy and its outcome? Is God really able to do things if you pray for them that he could not do in view of Satan's opposition if you're not praying? Who's watching? The rest the of the universe. The rest of the universe. Is that the essence of intercessory prayer? As we know, Abraham's intercession did not really accomplish very much. If we are praying for those we are trying to work for, does God take that into account? Okay, from our Bible study guide. Abraham had learned to love the inhabitants of Sodom, Gomorrah, and the other cities close by. This is why his prayer was honest and sincere. He already had fought against some kings who had defeated the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. After Abraham's victory, Bera, the king of Sodom, came to meet Abraham with Melchizedek. Bera asked to have his people return to their homes. Quote, give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. From Genesis. So why did he say that? That was the, I mean, there were so many little wars going on and raids and different things, and that was considered to be the right thing to do. Well, if you're, if you're, if you're a good person, you let the people go back, but you keep what you, what you got. That's from Genesis 14, 21. This is an indication of the love of this king for his people. Since one of the great characteristics of Abraham was love, he loved the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he prayed for them and their people. And what did he do with all the goods that he had gotten? He said, well, let my friends here have a little bit, but take the rest back. I don't need anything. I don't need any of your stuff. I mean, you know, I'm sure he was the wealthiest man around. I think he says, don't, I don't want you to be able to say that you made me rich. Right. Okay, Ellen White, Dwayne. Um, right in oh, the middle. Uh, love for perishing souls inspired Abraham's prayer. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 140. Well, do you think, so it, he was praying for, what does that tell us? Was he praying just for Lot and his family? Mm -mm. No. No, he was praying for all of them. Do you think Abraham was fully aware that he was bargaining with God in that prayer? Does the Holy Spirit work with our prayers? And you know the famous verse, Romans 8, 26, in the same way the Spirit also comes to help us, weak as we are, for we do not know how we ought to pray. The Spirit himself pleads with God for us in groans that words cannot express. Okay, that's, those are Paul's words. If you have friends or family members who do not accept or understand the truth about God, do you pray for them? Wouldn't that be the right thing to do? Do you expect the Holy Spirit to touch their hearts in one way or another? Is that presumptuous? I'm asking a lot of challenging questions here. If you don't pray for them, then that would be presumptuous. Okay, so if you really if you really want God to do something, it's reasonable to pray for them, isn't it? Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are both described in the Bible as pleading our cases before the throne of God. How does that actually happen? Zechariah had also explained what kind of processes were going on in heaven in terms of judgment and exploring the cases of individuals. Zechariah 3, 1 to 5. 
In another vision, the Lord showed me the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord. And there beside Joshua stood Satan, ready to bring an accusation against him. The angel of the Lord said to Satan, May the Lord condemn you, Satan. May the Lord, who loves Jerusalem, condemn you. This man is like a stick snatched from the fire. Joshua was standing there wearing filthy clothes. The angel said to his heavenly attendants, Take away the filthy clothes this man is wearing. Then he said to Joshua, I have taken away your sin and will give you new clothes to wear. He commanded the attendants to put on a clean turban on Joshua's head. They did so, and then they put on new clothes, put new clothes on him while the angel of the Lord stood there. Good news, Bible. Okay. Now I see that my thing messed up here. This messenger, and there was supposed to be a capital M there, angel, capital A, angel, was well, none other than Christ himself. He is the one who can give orders to angels and take away sins. So, I mean, that's pretty clear who that is. I, I made those changes and obviously something didn't get included. Sorry. While Abraham was talking with Christ, the two angels who had accompanied Christ continued to Sodom. And what happened? Genesis 19, verses 12 to 29. Continuing with Lot and the two angels in Sodom, and the story of Lot and the two angels in Sodom, the two men said to Lot, if you have anyone else here, sons, daughters, sons-in-law, or any other relatives living in the city, get them out of here because we are going to destroy this place. The Lord has heard the terrible accusations against these people and has sent us to destroy Sodom. Okay, God, God has sent us to destroy Sodom. Then Lot went to the men that his daughters were going to marry and said, hurry up and get out of here. The Lord is going to destroy this place. But they thought he was joking. At dawn, the angels tried to make Lot hurry. Quick, they said, take your wife and your two daughters and get out so that you will not lose your lives when the city is destroyed. Lot hesitated. The Lord, however, had pity on him. So the men took him, his wife, and his two daughters by the hand and led them out of the city. Then one of the angels said, run for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop in the valley. Run to the hills so that you won't be killed. Jumping to verse 23. The sun was rising when Lot reached Zor. Suddenly the Lord rained burning sulfur on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and destroyed them and the whole valley along with all the people there and everything that grew on the land. But Lot's wife looked back and was turned into a pillar of salt. Early the next, did you, did you have a comment? Well, notice here it says Yahweh rained burning sulfur on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and Lot's wife was turned into a pillar of salt. Who could do that? It sounds to me like it's only God that can do those things. Well, it was just covered with ash. And the, the, remember they found the Trinitite about, about eight or 10 feet or 12, 15 feet down uh, Trinitite is that yeah. sulfur or, or um, well, glass. Yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's a function of what happened. Yeah, well, we know that this happened otherwise. Why does it have to be attributed to Yahweh? Well, the, there's no explanation. That's, that's an interpretation on the part of editors. That's a lie. Well, the, the book before Genesis, apparently, was, was Job. Mm -hmm. And Job has four friends that are, don't understand Yahweh. They, they, each of them have a different Elohim. In fact, Job didn't even understand Yahweh until at the end, finally he throws up his hand, man, I don't know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But Yahweh, each one of the friends says, oh. God punishes, God destroys. Those are the lies told by the friends of Job, and that was before this story here in Sodom and Gomorrah, or... Uh, but it has nothing to do with the wording of this story. That story is, is edited. It's a bunch you of hearsay. You have no proof, absolutely no proof of that. You have no proof of anything else. You have no proof that this. We know that the scribes have made it into a lie. Jeremiah 8, well, verse 8. We know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. There's pretty good evidence for that. Uh, well, yeah, I, I'm not arguing that. We, 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 I mean, you find I'm out what about, has happened historically. Yeah. 
Verse 27, early the next morning, Abraham hurried to the place where he had stood in the presence of the Lord. He looked down at Sodom and Gomorrah and the whole valley and saw smoke rising from the land like smoke from a huge furnace. But when God destroyed the cities of the valley where Lot was living, he kept Abraham in mind and allowed Lot to escape to safety. Good News Bible. So we, we, we uh, have an affinity for a schizophrenic God is what we're saying. No, we're not. That's not all. Well, if we read the story that I did, we have one passage that says another, one way, another way. As God has, has a split personality. He has, to, he, he, he acts in different ways depending on the situation. God does, if you understand hu enough about human nature, God doesn't need to kill anybody. Human nature, humans will kill each other. Well, we're pretty, Sin good, pays we're, we're pretty good at that too. Not God. We, to help you understand what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah, if you have our handout, the word thing here, click on the link and you'll find out that there's good evidence that, and you can ask how this happened exactly, but um, it's a, what was, what's known as a cosmic airburst. A large meteorite came down and it, when it hit the atmosphere, it just exploded. And, and scattered, the, it, it happened probably over the northern end of the, of the Dead Sea and just scattered over the city, city of those, that whole part of the valley and wiped it out. So the, the text gives an interesting indication about the position of Lot in the city of Sodom. Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. That's what the text says. This means he was an important character in the city, certainly a public officer, because sitting in the gate is a privilege of officers, judges, and kings. People would, I mean, there were no telephones, nothing like that to get hold of people, so if you wanted to accomplish something, you find that person at the gate, and then you would approach the officer or the king or the whatever that's sitting in the gate to arbitrate. Biblical archaeological exploration and research at the site of Sodom indicates it was destroyed by what is called a cosmic airburst, a large meteorite exploding just above the earth and showering its pieces over the obliterated city. That cosmic airburst probably happened over the Dead Sea and then scattered its fragments, fire and brimstone over the valley north and east of the Dead Sea, destroying not only Sodom and Gomorrah, but also several other small towns nearby, including Adma and Zeboim. Uh, and it talks about them in Hosea 11. Unfortunately, as in the case of Noah and the flood, only a few people escaped that catastrophe. The, uh, that might give us a clue about how many we can expect to respond to our efforts to evangelize. This does not mean that God and the Holy Spirit are ineffective in reaching men's hearts or minds, but rather that people always have free will and freedom to reject any efforts we may take to reach them. Is that, uh, that mean we should discourage, we should become discouraged about tr even trying? Kind of sounds that way. Um, That's a far a more logical explanation of what you've just rendered there, Ken. I, I really appreciate that. We should always remember that the saving even one soul is worth all the effort that we can ever spend in this life. Abraham apparently recognized when he was called from Ur of the Chaldees to go to Palestine, that God intended for him to be an evangelist. I mean, w what we have there is God says, go, I'm taking you to a place and it's gonna be your, your home. Surely God, if he's giving him that kind of information, must give him some additional information. I mean, I don't know, I, at least that would be my understanding. God would certainly tell, tell him something more Look at all the people that attached themselves to his camp. Abraham was willing to do God's will. Think of the challenging experiences that Abraham went through, including his problems in Egypt, the famine that led him to go there, and this story about the destruction of the nearby cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you think Abraham had ever been to Sodom and Gomorrah when there were flourishing cities? Obviously, he went down there and up the other side when he was chasing those uh, people. I mean, up is somewhere close to Damascus. That's a long ways. Well, our Bible study guide says, who's next? No idea. Jim, I think. Jim? Yeah, thanks. Jim? Okay. 
Can you tell us the challenges? Well, the Bible said he got a challenge. In our cities, we face obstacles in preaching the gospel appropriately and effectively. We need to plead with God, excuse me, we need to plead with God to intervene. That's what really? our, our intercessory prayers, okay? Challenge up, find a way to contact someone who is being directed, excuse me, directly affected by the difficult situation similar to your own. Tell that person you are praying for him or her and ask God to show you what to do to help. What well, you can Bible do to help. Yeah, what you can do to okay. help. Love for your perishing souls inspired Abraham's prayer. What he loathed the sin of that corrupt city, he desired that the sinners might be saved. He, excuse me, his deep interest for Sodom shows the anxiety that we should feel for the impenitent. We should cherish hatred of sin, but pity and love for the sinner. Okay, All I around. Wanna, I want to interrupt there for a second. How many of us have achieved that goal? hate the sin and love the sinner. What do we normally do as human beings? Right, we right love, off the sinner. We love the sin, we hate the sinner. Mm. It's, this is a real, I mean, this is a challenge, it's not easy. I mean, look, look at what's going on in our world today. We're supposed to accept everybody no matter what their behavior is and we're supposed to love them. Yeah, but we aren't supposed to love their sins. But love also means let people have plenty of rope to self-destruct, uh, and they will, mm -hmm. uh, and, and unless they want to choose to listen. Mm -hmm. God's the greatest, what it says, the number one commandment is to listen. Well, it's not a commandment, it's a prescription for life. Mm -hmm. God does not command, if we get over that, uh, that point of view that God has a stern, well, a, a, God says, choose life. Yeah. That's a choice. Without cho freedom to choose, you don't have life and you don't have love. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go on, go ahead. All around us, our soul is going down to ruin as hopeless, as terrible as that for which you befell Sodom. Every day, the probation for, of some is clothing. closing. Every hour, some are passing through the re reach of mercy, beyond the reach of mercy, excuse me. And where are the voices of warning and, and, and entreaty to bid the sinner flee from this fearful doom? Where are the hands stretched out to draw him back from death? Where are those who, with humility and persevering faith, are pleading with God for him? The spirit of Abraham with the with the Spirit of Christ. The Son of God is Himself the great intercessor in the sinner's behalf. He who has paid the price for His redemption knows the worth of the human soul. With an antagonism to evil such as cannot, can exist only in the nature spotless, spotlessly pure, Christ manifested toward the sinner a love which infinite goodness alone could conceive. I mean, it, this is, just think about this. The, the only perfectly pure, perfectly sinless person in the world loves the very worst. He doesn't love what they do. He doesn't love their sins. He doesn't love their, their bad influence in some cases like that, but he loves them. And, and I mean, the obvious example that we can think about is even families. If you have a child that's turning away and just doing all sorts of awful things, of course, some people in the human situation, uh, they, they, you know, just abandon their children. But a person who is a Christian, a loving, he still loves that child, even if the child's doing awful things. Um, but here's, you know, the very best loving the very worst. I mean, this is amazing. Okay. In the agonies of the crucifixion, himself burdened with the awful weight of the sins of the whole world, he prayed for his revilers and murderers. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke 23, 34, from the Patriarch of the Prophet, Prophets, uh, page 140. Okay. So how do we learn how to love sinners and hate the sin? This is a challenging characteristic on which we all need to work. God asks us to hate the sin because of what it does to the sinner. But we are to love the sinner. 
our tendency is to love the sin and despise the sinner. Carrie? Abraham was honored by the surrounding nations as a mighty prince and a wise and able chief. He did not shut away his influence from his neighbors. His life and character in the marked contrast with those of the worshipers of idols. And where's the other line there? Exerting a telling influence in favor of true faith. His allegiance to God was unswerving while his affability and benevolence inspired confidence and friendship and his unaffected greatness commanded respect and honor from Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophet, page 133, 134. Now, just think about that situation. We, we read the quotation from her that she had more than a thousand people in his household. Did he, did he call them together for services of some kind? How did, I mean, and, and how did he, I mean, he must have had some kind of interaction with each one of them personally, because, I mean, why were they attracted to him? I mean, this wasn't a case of he's the, he paid the best wages around, I don't think. Well, he inspired confidence and friendship. Yeah. I mean, how does that work? Well, so what became of Lot and his daughters? I don't know whether we... Descendants were, were Amma, Amma, yeah. Moab and Ammon. <laughs> because Lot was afraid to stay, stay in Zoar, he and his two daughters moved up into the hills and lived in a cave. The elder daughter said to her sister, our father is getting old and there are no men in the whole world to marry us so that we can have children. I mean, this is, I mean, she is, re well, her, their mother was from Sodom and she's reflecting those ideas. I, I don't think, I don't, don't know any other way to explain that. Come on now, come on, let's make our father drunk so that we can sleep with him and have children by him. Okay, they're living in a cave how do you, what do you do to make your father get drunk? <laughs> you have an affinity for alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> Where do you get alcohol? <laughs> that night they gave him wine to drink and the elder daughter had intercourse with him, but he was so drunk that he didn't know it. Again, this seems just unbelievable to me. The next day, the, the elder daughter said to her sister, I slept with him last night. Now let's make him drunk again tonight and you slept with him and each one of us will have a child to our father. I mean, you know, what are the chances of that? Moses. Anyway. The history is. <laughs> he was the ancestor of the present day Moabites. The younger sister also had a son whom she named ben Ammi. He was an ancestor of the present day Ammonites. Wow. Wouldn't most of us, if we knew in advance what was going to happen to this family, have allowed them just to perish with the others in Sodom? And the question that I have is, why didn't they go to Uncle Abraham's place? What, Yahweh sent a couple messengers down there to rescue them. They didn't, uh, <laughs> they got them out of town. Then they, were fine, free, they were free to go wherever they want. And, and the wife, she wanted to go back. I'm not arguing with that, but my, the argument is, would you rather live in a cave or would you rather go to Uncle Abraham's house? Well, well I mean, that, people certain, are going to be standing outside the gates of heaven. Uh, yeah. A lot of, lot of stress was going on that they'd experienced there. <laughs> and we be happy there. Why do you think this story is in the Bible? Did Lot know that his, his, his daughters were so much like Sodom that they wouldn't tolerate Uncle Abraham? Probably. We, we know that the descendants of Lot caused a lot of problems for the children of Israel through the ages. Yet, did but uh, the, one of the Moabites was uh, did, uh, an, the ancestors of uh, Jesus. Yeah. So, mm. Okay, I think it's yours. Yeah, Bible study guide. Think about this. Would you deem Abraham's intercession for Sodom and Gomorrah successful or a failure? Hmm. <laughs> October 27th. Well, 1 John 4, 8 and 16 tell us that God is love. How should a God of love deal with stories like this one? Should the story just have been left out? We don't do, 
We don't tell. There's a lot of stories you don't tell. Well, people, all intelligent creatures need to have the opportunity to experience enough evil to re learn to reject it and then to choose the good. Okay. And so, yeah, okay. Fair enough. So, if someone asks us about this story, how do we explain it? Well, they're not listed as an example of, of uh, righteous living, and they're, they're, not, they're not sugar coated in, in, in their story. It's interesting story. that in the New Testament, Lot is called a righteous man. Well, he did a couple of things that show other Bible writers, anyway. Uh, okay. If you find yourself talking to someone with virtually no background in Scripture, it is best to start with the Gospels. Amen. Especially the Gospel of John. Compassion and sharing are an important part of our work to reach out. Jesus was incredibly successful at doing that. Given what you know about the history of the Israelites from the days of Abraham to our day, would you say that God's mission to the Middle East and the whole world has been successful? Well, those, a lot of them are Abraham's descendants, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> a chunk of them. <laughs> they all call themselves the children of Abraham. Yeah. Scholars have often debated whether or not, well, I'm sorry, that should be yours, Myra, I think. Or, Dwayne. Dwayne, Dwayne, I'm sorry, go ahead. Scholars have often debated whether or not Jesus' primary concern was working among the Jews or with the wider world. Some argue that because Jesus spent most of his time with the Jews and told his disciples to do the same, at least while he was with them, the Jews were his central focus. There is some truth to this idea, but there are numerous instances in which Jesus demonstrated that his love was for more than just the Jews. Several times he quoted Old Testament narratives and highlighted the faith of non-Jewish people, such as the stories of the widow of Zarephath, Naaman, and the Queen of Sheba. Jesus spent time outside of Judea with non-Jews, including a few nights in a Samaritan town, and a visit to the region of Tyre and Sidon, not to mention the Decapolis, which Gentiles populated from the adult Sabbath school. Yeah, is it reasonable for God to expect us who have experienced His love to share with others? What are the best ways for doing that? Well, we'll leave that challenge up to you because we're running out of time. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for these challenges. They lead to some challenging issues for us to think about and ideas about how some of this took place. Help us to know the best approach and how to understand these scriptures correctly. But most of all, help us to understand your love and find better ways to share it with others is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.